Non-Monogamy Help is a podcast where your questions about open, non-monogamous or polyamorous relationships are answered. Our host, Lola Phoenix, will consult a licensed therapist with over a decade of experience to address your problems. Names and locations have been changed or censored to keep your questions anonymous. You're listening to Non-Monogamy Help, the podcast. Welcome to episode 123 of the Non-Monogamy Help podcast. I'm Lola Phoenix. Please send any questions you have to ask at nonmonogamyhelp.com. And you can also record a question at nonmonogamyhelp.com forward slash contact if you would like to. And you can also get all the columns and the podcast and everything else at nonmonogamyhelp.com. If you want to really support the columns and the podcast, there are kind of two things that you can do. You can become a Patreon, which is always helpful. You can do that at patreon.com forward slash Lola Phoenix. And you can also sign up to the email newsletter. That is actually really, really helpful because social media is basically wanting me to buy ads and they're going to allow people to follow me, but they're going to restrict the amount that any update I put on those platforms actually reaches you because that's their game. That's what they do. And email is like the only platform where I can actually reach every single one of my audience without having to pay Uh, for ads and stuff like that. So signing up to my email newsletter is actually one of the most helpful things you can do. You can do that by going to nonmonogamyhelp.com forward slash email. And I'll only email you once a week. I'm not going to be nuts about it. And it's very predictable. And you'll get also discount codes and other fun things. So definitely sign up to my email list. And you can, if you so wish, follow on Twitter and Instagram at nonmonogamyhelp. Let's actually, we are not going to have a discussion question this week because this episode has a lot of different questions in it. Someone sent me like a whole list of a bunch of different questions. It's almost like a Q&A episode. So I think if you want to use a discussion question, you can use any of the questions that this person has asked. So we're not going to do a discussion question this week. So let's go ahead actually before we go through the questions because I'm going to I'm going to do this like a Q&A episode because it's kind of like that anyway. So before I get to the questions and the answers, I also want to remind you of this episode sponsor BetterHelp. Quite often in a lot of my columns and podcasts, I encourage people to seek a polyamory friendly therapist and it's super supportive and super helpful for lots of people, but it's not necessarily something that's accessible for everyone because they may live in a small town, yada, yada. BetterHelp allows you to find therapists online. You can send messages to at any time of the day, and they also do offer you some financial aid. You can get 10% off your first month by using the promo code nonmonogamyhelp at checkout, or you can go to betterhelp.com forward slash nonmonogamyhelp. Right, let's get to this week's questions and answers. question that this person says, uh, you're on a first date with someone. How do you tell them that you are poly? Actually, I think they wrote polyandrous. And when do you say it? Like when you say your sexuality or do you hold it until later when you know each other properly? Even so, there's a risk that they'd leave you after you tell them. So firstly, you've kind of used in your questions a lot of different words. You've used the word polyandry, polyandrous, and then you've also, yeah, you've used the word polyandrous. As far as I know, so there's there's polygamy, there's polyandry, and there's po- polyamory. And you may not be an English uh, as a first language speaker, and that's totally fine. But there as, is actually slight differences between these words. I did actually, I don't know, I think it was in the Q&A, most recent Q&A episode where I actually spoke about this. But the difference is that historically, just to give you a bit of background, historically, relationships between people, marriages, weren't based on love or companionship. I'm not saying no one ever got married because of love in the past, blah, blah, blah. But romance and love were not really prioritized by many societies way back in the day. So a lot of marriages and relationships were really like about like securing your future, familial bonds, power exchange, things like that. They didn't have the same kind of context. So when you're talking about like polygamy, for example, in the Bible and other kinds of things, you're talking about a different type of social structure and a different social way of looking at relationships and marriage. Historically, marriage has been about like basically exchanging one family selling off their daughter for money. Like that is kind of what it's been about. If you look at what a husband is, animal husbandry is a thing. So, you know, I'm not saying that marriage means that now. Obviously, it's different for people now. But if you're using words like polygamy, if I recall correctly, that specifically refers to a practice of a husband having multiple wives. And I would assume that polyandry 
is the same, but with a wife having multiple husbands. So I don't know anything about polygamy or polyandry. I don't really socially know very much about plural marriage. I don't, I've never researched it. I've never, so I can't really speak to that culturally and how it has happened in the past or how it happens now. Polyamory is specifically about having multiple romantic relationships and, and that being, and not being restricted by gender. And if I recall correctly, like polygamy and polyandry, those could be like, definitely everyone lives together, et cetera. I don't know. But I'm saying that polyamory is a lot more, uh, it doesn't require any specific gender or anything like that. So that's the difference between those terms. So I'm not sure if you actually mean polyamory or if you, why you're using the word polyandry. I can't really speak to what polyandry is. I, I don't have anything to do with that. So that's the first thing. Second thing. Yeah, there is a risk someone will leave you after you tell them that you're polyamorous. There's also a risk someone will leave you if you tell them you don't want to have kids. There's also a, a risk that someone will leave you if you tell them that you have a history of mental illness. There's also a risk that someone will leave you for any reason. There's always a risk that someone's going to leave you. I think in the case of polyamory, because it's such a different lifestyle, because it's, and, and it's the same, like if you are a doctor or a lawyer, or you have a really high, or, or if you're in the military, like, I think that there's, there are things that I put on my profile that indicate things like you have for reasons we have on dating sites. Do you want to have kids or you don't want to have kids? It's not because there's any judgment either way about, I mean, some people do judge, but it's not because there's a one right way to do things. It's just that if you definitely want to have kids, that's a different lifestyle choice than someone who definitely doesn't. And equally, if you want to be polyamorous, if you want to have multiple romantic relationships, that is a different lifestyle choice than someone who does not. So it's about like, you know, ask yourself, do you really want to be in a situation where you're spending time with someone who definitely doesn't want to have the same type of life you do? Do you really want to be in a situation where you basically have someone who likes you so much that they're willing to try something that they kind of know that they don't really want, but they're just doing it because they don't want to have to deal with the sadness and pain of losing you? I would just put it on my profile and I would just be super honest with people from the get go. And maybe that would scare some people away, but those people aren't meant for me. So I think that you should just be honest about what you want. If, some, if something that you want is so critical, then be honest about it from the get-go. Like don't, you know, like I have a friend who is very child-free. She does not, she not only doesn't want to have children, but she doesn't want to date anyone with children. And that's her prerogative. And she puts that on her dating profiles and is very, very clear. And she still gets dudes who swipe on her who have kids. And she's like, no. <laughs> and that's her prerogative. That's fine. And, and that's what she wants. But she's very clear about that. So I think just be clear about it so you don't waste your time and other people's time. Second question you have here is, how would you introduce your family to your spouses or significant others? Do you go one by one or all together? What would you say is the best approach? I think there is no best approach. It really depends on your family and your own personal feelings about it. Different people have different feelings about their family. I don't have any familial relations, really. I don't speak to either of my parents. I don't have any, I have like, I talk to one cousin. That's pretty much it. I don't have any close family bonds. So none of this is super important to me. And I would like to actually be with someone. I actually found this out, not fairly recently, but like within my last relationship, I would like to meet my partner's uh, family and I would like us to be able to get along and I would like to be able to fit into their family. And I think I could deal with a situation where I had a partner who was like me and didn't have any family. Um, but I think that if I didn't fit in well with them for sorts of various types of reasons, that would be a problem for me. For some people, they wouldn't care. So it really depends. Like, and are you the type of person where if you do tell your family that you're polyamorous, will they disown you? Are you economically reliant on your family in any way? Or are you completely, you know, you don't care if they disown you. Can you deal with them disowning you? So just, it really depends. Like that's such a wide question that is so dependent upon your own personal feelings. Like for a lot of people, they could never ever live without their family accepting them. And they would never ever put their family in a situation where they would see all their partners because they know it wouldn't be accepted and they know it would cause an issue. And I don't think that that's a bad way to go about things. It just depends on what family is to you, what it means to you, how your family is. So I don't think there is a best approach. It just comes down to your personal feelings about your own family, how you feel like, 
what would be best for your partners or significant others. You might have a significant other who doesn't want to meet your family, who doesn't want to be involved in all that. It's super stressful. I mean, I do want to be involved in it, but when I have been involved in it, it has been really, really stressful and really difficult for me, especially when I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was very accepted by the family and that, that caused a whole lot of other problems. So you may have a partner who doesn't want to meet your family. What will you do in that case? So there is no best approach, really depends on the person. And your last question is within polyamory, you mean, how do I make a, an equal relationship with all of your significant others together? Do you make a timesheet or something? What would be your tips? So I think that you need to think of this. That's sort of like asking, like, if you have multiple kids, how do you make sure that you spend time with all of your kids and treat them all the same? And I think that the first thing is, and I'm not a parent, and I could be wrong about this, but from what information I've gathered and from what I've learned, I think the first thing is to have an understanding that different people are different. Different people have different needs. Different people have different wants. Different people need different things from you. And so I think if you try to approach, and it's the same with friendships, like how do you deal with having more than one friend in your life? Like you, not everyone needs the same relate, same type of relationship with you. And not every relationship is going to be equal in that sense. Like not every relationship is going to be directly comparable, directly the same. And you don't always have to be like, okay, I have five partners. I need to spend, I have 24 hours in a day. I have this, you know, I need to spend this amount of time and we, everything needs to be equal. And I don't think that that's a realistic approach because it, not everyone needs everything to be exactly equal. Not everyone has the same needs. Some people may need more of your time. If you have a partner that maybe suddenly like their parent dies, they may need more time with from you than someone else who hasn't had that. And things won't stay the same all throughout your life. Like not everyone it needs their partner in the same way all throughout their life. There may be a time when you need more help than, than the other person does. So I don't think that there needs to be exact, definite, equally equality between every single relationship. I don't think that that's realistic. And I don't think that that's what everyone needs. I think in terms of balancing your time, I think that I would ask people what they need ask, you know, come to a compromise because again, you know, it, the level to which th th you're never going to reach. And this is what people mean. People say one person can't fit all your needs. And I think that that's kind of like a, a misnomer or not an adequate way to say thing because there are people who have been monogamous. There are people who have been dating one person since high school their entire lives and have never divorced and never married anyone new. Like, obviously that's not every single person, but the idea that one person can't meet all your needs is kind of stupid in my opinion. But I don't think that you should expect each other to be completely and utterly compatible. That is what I would say. Even in monogamy, I would not expect a relationship to be 100%. You never have any issues. You never have any clashes. You never have any differences. You have the, I mean, maybe that can happen, but it's very, very rare. So not every single person you're, are you going to be directly and completely and wholly compatible with. It's all about how you can meet each other's needs and relationships and compromise together and build something together. And less about one person kind of like, you know, you being like, catching people like a Pokemon to meet all your needs. That's not, that's not what we're doing here. So have a talk with the person. Think about what you need out of a relationship to, for it basically to survive. You may in this discussion, even if you're both polyamorous, you may figure out that you're not compatible because this one person has different needs and you can't meet those or you don't want to meet those or they have, or you have needs that they don't want or can't meet. So you Figure out what it is that you want out of a relationship. Figure out what it is that you need. And sometimes you have to figure that out through practice. Sometimes you don't have enough experience with yourself to know. But have discussions with one another about, okay, I'd like to spend this time. And I think I always advise people, even when they're monogamous and they live together, I always advise people to have set time together, to schedule set time together. Because I think there's something about scheduling and, and maybe I'm just like such a Virgo, but like, I think there's something about like setting time, intentional time together. That is actually really important in all relationships, not just, not just romantic relationships. I have a set time. Like I have a friend where we have a set call. We don't, we'd like to call each other every week. We don't always do that. We sometimes have to put it off, but we have a set time. And I actually really like that. I actually feel like we don't necessarily chat to each other every day, but we have a set time. And I really like that because it, it makes me feel like we, our relationship is super, I don't feel like our relationship is one-sided. I don't feel like I always have to start conversations. We just have this 
set time and it's really brilliant. And, and I think that that is, I feel more connected with that friend than I do with other people because we have that. So I, I encourage that. I think you should, you know, there's a lot of jokes about Google calendar being super popular in polyamory communities. And that's for a reason. Scheduling time together is a really, uh, is a really good thing to do. Even if you're monogamous, I think, because when you have that penciled out, I just think it, it has a lot of more meaning. So yeah, those were all of your questions. I'm not going to sum them up because I, I just went through like three of them. But thank you for writing and I hope that helps and good luck. Thank you for listening to episode 123 of the Non-Monogamy Hell podcast. If you want to be awesome, you can become a patron. That really helps me. And if you donate to the podcast shout out tier and you let me know what your name is and how to pronounce it, because I am not going to guess, you will have your name read at the end of the podcast. And that's that time is now. The current patrons are Laura Boylan, Chris Albrecht Jones, Juke, Nikki Jones, James Wardell, Justin Calm, and Aaliyah. And if for whatever reason you can't do this, because I totally understand, like, people don't have disposable income, even though it's very, a little bit, you know, every little bit is important to save sometimes. And it's, it's a, it's a mess out there. So if you want to help support the podcast in some way, then what you can do are two things. One is rate and review the podcast on whatever platform, Spotify, iTunes, whatever you have access to. Let's take you two seconds. Doing that just helps me. Like the more ratings my podcast has, the more likely I can maybe get a sponsor and one day pay for an editor so I have to do all this shit myself. That would be super helpful for me. So if you can take just two seconds to do that, I'd really, really appreciate that. If there's a way to do it on Google Podcasts, I don't know. If you can do it, I'd super appreciate it. The other thing that you can do is join my email list. I haven't really talked about this very much, but actually I'm putting a lot of time into social media platforms. And because of this whole thing that I've read about charging people to use Twitter, I'm not paying for Twitter, y'all. I'm not paying for it. I don't want to pay for it. And to be honest, the email list is better because with all social media, they are ad selling platforms. That's their main goal. They want me to buy ads Every time I have a new thing that I want to release, they're always going to try and limit my reach so that I panic and go, oh, I haven't got as many followers or I haven't got as many people seeing this story, blah, blah, blah. Like their goal is to get me to buy ads. I know I buy, I, I work in digital advertising, so that's what they want me to do. And following me on socials does help. I'm not saying it doesn't help. It's at Namanagami Help at on uh, Twitter and Instagram. It does help, but I can't possibly reach all of the people who follow me because they literally don't want me to be able to because they want to sell ads. So the best way Way that you can actually support me is by signing up to the email list because I only email you once a week and send you the column and podcast three days before it's actually released live to the public. And it just actually it allows me to reach the people who actually want to hear from me instead of having to pay to do so. So if you can, if you can do that and you can like, you know, you don't have, I, you don't have to open them. You don't have to click on, I mean, if you don't open them in a few while, anyway, the, the point is, <laughs> if you want to sign up to my email list, that would actually be super helpful. You can do that at nonmonogamyhelp.com forward slash email. I don't use uh, any platform that resells your data. I use quality platforms. I understand about data protection. I don't resell your data and I keep it safe. And I also don't bug you more than once a week if I can help it. If I accidentally send out an email that I'll be like, whoops. But yeah, only once a week emails. That would be super helpful. So if you can sign up to my email list, I'd really appreciate it. All right, I'll shut up now. That's all for this week. You can get a new column next Friday and another podcast episode in a fortnight. Thank you again for listening. You've been listening to Nominogamy Help. The podcast music was done by Chris Albury Jones at albury jones.com. Our podcast art was done by Dom Young, and you can visit Dom's site at D-O-M-D-U-O-N-G.com. Thank you again for listening.